And, and I'm not just a uh, psychiatric mental health clinical nurse specialist. I'm also a board certified advanced practice holistic nurse um, through the American Holistic Nurses Credentialing Corporation. So I have lots of expertise in lots of different areas. So today I'm going to be talking with you about holistic treatment of ADHD in children, adolescents. And the cool thing about this is that you're all going to walk away feeling like holistic providers today, even if you didn't walk in the room feeling like holistic providers today. <laughs> it's in all of us. So holistic psychiatry uh, really focuses on the whole person with particular attention to body, mind, and spirit in collaboration, not separately. It's very patient-centered, and we focus on health promotion and prevention. And um, later this year, I'm gonna come back and talk a whole lot more about holistic psychiatry as a whole, um, but I just wanted to do a little bit of a brief overview um, so that we know what I'm referring to and what I'm talking about. So holistic psychiatry isn't just Western medicine, it isn't just Eastern medicine, it isn't just complementary or integrative or alternative, it's all of those things combined um, to be holistic. So how is holistic psychiatry specifically different from a Western or allopathic psychiatric care model? Um, what we don't do is we don't put mental health into a silo. A lot of times when you would re receive a referral or um, have somebody come into your office that's been sent for psychiatry or psychology, you know, they want a specialist and they want somebody to look at just the psychiatric mental health components of the concern. But what we are looking at in holistic psychiatry are all of the other things from the biological to the emotional to the spiritual to the emotional components. Um, it recognizes that there's a connection between the body and the mind. And any of us who have had like butterflies in our stomach when we're nervous or any of us who've had sweaty palms when we're anxious or excited know that there's an incredible link between what our mind is thinking, what our body is doing in response to that. Um, holistic psychiatry focuses less on pharmaceutical intervention, and you'll notice that I said less and it not exclusively eliminating pharmaceutical intervention because there is a place and a time for this. And I think that that is something maybe unique to me in the holistic realm because I do have some colleagues who take a very black and white stance on um, holistic care and exclude pharmaceutical intervention. I myself don't use pharmaceuticals in my practice, but I'm happy to refer people when they do get to the point where they, ne they need pharmaceutical intervention. Um, and it focuses on identification of root cause versus symptom suppression. So always my objective is to go back and dig a little deeper and look a little deeper and see if we can determine what the root cause of the symptom presentation is versus treating the symptoms exclusively. Um, and then I know that this group probably has a good sense of what ADHD is, but I do use this presentation for other groups. So I figured I'd keep this in as a high level overview. Um, really ADHD stands for Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, no surprise there. Um, colloquially, it's often called ADD and you'll have people in, that you'll encounter in everyday life that will call it ADD because that's what they've heard. Um, it referred to if their child doesn't particularly have hyperactivity, um, but truly Truly, the DSM diagnosis is ADHD. Um, it was identified as early as 1902, but at that point it was classified as a moral issue. And so while we're still working to reduce the stigma of mental illness, we have come a long way from ADHD being classified as a moral issue. Um, it first began to receive medical treatment in the 1970s with the introduction of the stimulant medication Ritalin, which is a methylphenidate product. And according to the most recent statistics from the CDC, um, in 2016, there um, were 9.4% of the US population, or about 6.1 million children, who had been diagnosed with ADHD. Um, and 2015 data uh, indicate 3% of the worldwide population um, under the age of 18 are diagnosed with ADHD. It's not just a U.S. population concern. It is a worldwide concern, um, but certainly we are seeing higher rates of diagnosis in the United States. 
Um, so there are three different subtypes of ADHD that can be specifically diagnosed according to the DSM-5. You have ADHD and attentive type, hyperactive impulsive type, and combined type. And what I really like to talk about at this point is that this is a label, right? It's a diagnosis that we use to help um, obtain insurance reimbursement and possibly IEPs and ensure good access to care for our patients and their families. But what I really like to mention as a holistic provider is that we want to make sure that this diagnosis never defines a child or limits his or her potential. And so that's a really big platform for us in our, in our practice. Um, teachers, parents, and providers should use caution when applying this label. And I always like to talk with my patients about what it means and what it is, and that it doesn't change anything about what they can accomplish in their lives and their overall expectancy of productivity and success in their lives. Um, so, Ultimately, I try to let them know that just like them having blonde hair or blue eyes or white skin, it's just part of who they are, but it doesn't have to define them. <clears throat> and this is just my very, very, very busy slide of all of the different diagnostic criteria for ADHD. I like to make sure that people know that it, there are a multitude of different factors that go into that diagnosis. Some of them can be highly subjective, and so I like to pull out some of those, like often fidgets or taps hands or feet and squirms in seat. And I, I think, okay, we're using the word often. That's pretty subjective, right? Um, some of us might feel like if you do it three times in an hour, that's often, or if we do it 52 times in an hour, that's often. Um, so there's a lot of variability in the subjectivity of the diagnosis at times. <clears throat> so we have the ongoing hypothesis of the neurobiological cause of ADHD is the neurotransmitter hypothesis going back to the late 1990s and it implicates catecholamine, um, so specifically the norepinephrine, dopamine, and epinephrine dysregulation and truly by dysregulation they're claiming hypoactivation in the prefrontal cortex as being the cause of ADHD. And of course most of us in the room know that this is not one singular cause of ADHD but this is the hypothesis on which most of our treatment is based. Um, it is the foundation for the use of stimulant medications, which are theorized to increase norepinephrine and dopamine availability in the prefrontal cortex. So one of the problems with this um, neurotransmitter hypothesis is that we can't get in there and measure those neurotransmitters in a meaningful way. And there have been organizations that have been able to measure neurotransmitters, of course, but there doesn't seem to be any definitive correlation with like an, an amount of neurotransmitter in your brain being correlated with a diagnosis of ADHD. So just to throw out an, a, an arbitrary term, like Doug could have 10 and Russell could have 10 and I could have 20 and Jamie could have five and maybe we all have ADHD. <laughs> so it doesn't, it's not necessarily meaningful to measure neurotransmitters. So that doesn't help us. <laughs> <laughs> And stimulating norepinephrine and dopamine cannot be localized to the prefrontal cortex, which is often what results in side effects such as loss of appetite, weight loss, irritability, aggression, and in some cases even hallucinations. So if you think about it, we're stimulating that norepinephrine, dopamine, and ultimately epinephrine, um, and we're aiming for that prefrontal cortex, but sometimes, you know, we get that activation in our limbic system, which is causing completely different um, results than we we're intending. Um, the use of stimulant medications do not produce an enduring cure for hypoactivation of catecholamines, so that medication, those stimulant medications are not going into the body and curing that dysregulation and resulting in um, symptom rem remission over an extended period of time. You have to take them every day in order for them to work. And if you don't take them, they don't work. What they're, uh, and data indicate that after being on the medication for 10 months, there's only about a 50% symptom reduction and at 36 months, increased symptoms and a need for more services were reported. And that's based on um, a 2013 um, book actually. So when we see in clinical practice patients who need increasing and increasing doses of stimulant medication, um, this is tied into that idea where um, we kind of chase it 
um, over time. So when we look at a Western or allopathic treatment model for ADHD, um, and this is what you would find in most um, organizations in the area, a child may be identified as being hyperactive, inattentive, or impulsive. A lot of times this is highlighted by parents and teachers, caregivers, daycare providers, before or after school program providers. Um, and so a parent presents with a concern of some hyperactivity, inattentiveness, impulsivity, or all of the above. And we typically use an evaluation tool such as a Connors or a Vanderbilt scale, which gets completed by parents and teachers to give us a little bit more rounded feedback, right? Um, if they meet diagnostic criteria, they may be diagnosed with ADHD, um, either the hyperactive impulsive type, an attentive type, or a combined type of hyperactive impulsive and an attentive. And the provider may end up prescribing a stimulant medication. So the stimulant medications are the psychopharmaceutical agents that stimulate norepinephrine and dopamine in an effort to improve symptoms. Um, these stimulant medications are scheduled to pharmaceutical agents, which typically fall into the amphetamine class. So those are your Adderall, Adderall XR, Vyvanse, Dexedrine um, products, or your methylphenidate products, such as the Ritalin, Concerta, Detrana, Ritalin LA, Focalin, um, and et cetera. And we do see um, never-ending manifestations of these products for people who might need a patch or might need a liquid or might need a short-acting or a long-acting or a mid-acting. Um, so there are new products hitting the market every day for the Schedule II um, stimulant medications. Over time, though, these stimulant medications lose efficacy and we have to titrate the dose to achieve symptom remission. That's not always necessarily the case, but we see it very frequently, especially in kids. Um, they adapt very easily to medications. <laughs> And when the stimulant medication is discontinued, the symptoms return. So it really ends up being kind of a continuous process with the psychopharmaceutical with the stimulant medications. Um, the provider may also recommend behavioral or cognitive behavioral therapy or executive skill building um, therapies. And that's always a, a really wonderful intervention as well. So how would that differ from a holistic treatment of ADHD? As a holistic care provider, I do very much the same things, um, just at different times and at diff in different ways, I guess I would say. So a child may present with the same initial concerns about hyperactivity, inattentiveness, or impulsivity. Um, and again, there's a comprehensive evaluation, including observations from the family, the patient, and others. And occasionally, I do use Vanderbilt scales of something of that nature. But because those are very subjective sometimes and they're interpreted differently by different people, I always like to go in and look at medical history, social history, trauma and abuse history, diet, exercise, sleep, and family dynamics. And in a perfect world, that's why I say we're all holistic providers. We want to do all of these things anyway and we want to assess these things. Um, but sometimes in that traditional allopathic model, we don't have the opportunity to get into this level of detail um, in like a 15 minute initial medication or um, uh, well, a sick child visit. Um, so what we do is we stitch together all of this information to develop a treatment plan with the patient and family, and decisions are made together as a treatment team um, in the model of collaborative decision making. And again, that's probably something that many of us um, as providers do on a regular basis, but just again being mindful that what the family and what the child wants are very valuable input in that treatment planning. So for this group specifically, I added some of our evidence-based holistic interventions that um, I particularly use when I'm looking at kids that may have come in either with a pre-existing diagnosis of ADHD or concerns for ADHD. Um, so one of my favorite things are executive skill building interventions. Um, so these are uh, the, the activities that we are able to perform as our prefrontal cortex develops. So we can see improvement in self-regulation, attention, working memory, cognitive flexibility, behavioral inhibition, and the ability to sustain attention. Um, 
two of my favorite resources for this are the Smart But Scattered book, which are, they're written for parents and they're written in a way that is very accessible to parents. It's not just in psychobabble that we like to hear ourselves talk, but <laughs> parents don't always like to hear us speak in that way. But it gives you very pragmatic interventions for how to do something like your child is chronically late. Well, so there may be an activity in there about um, becoming more familiar about um, time and giving like a five or 10 minute warning or using a timer and develop using these exercises to develop that um, executive skill, which is not just something that serves them now in childhood, but it does serve them down the road as adults as well. Um, and then the second resource for that that I didn't put on there, but I wanted to mention is that Akron Children's Hospital has an executive skill building clinic where we can refer children um, to receive, it's usually like a 10 or 12 week program that the parents um, and the child go to to kind of work on executive skill building activities, um, which again are lifelong skills that we can learn. Um, and then exercise interventions. We know that the um, American Academy of Pediatrics recommends 60 minutes of physical activity a day for kids and teens, and um, they're often not getting that. And so short and long-term benefits of exercise, particularly cardiovascular exercise, are known to improve cognitive, behavioral, and social emotional functioning in children with ADHD. So one of the things that we're already encouraging families to do, have that physical activity, is uh, something that then can also be used as part of the treatment plan. So you're kind of covering two bases with one recommendation. And a lot of times we see families who love and swear by physical activities such as Taekwondo or Tai Chi and yoga, which is a special interest of mine. Um, so those are always really fun activities for kids to get involved in, especially in groups with other kids as well. Um, and then I could go on and on and on about dietary interventions for kids um, and teens with ADHD type symptoms and with really any mental health or physical health symptoms, but I've tried to rein myself in here. <laughs> so we're gonna focus on some of the big ones. Um, so some of the evidence-based interventions for um, kids who have ADHD symptoms are to um, look at zinc and magnesium. ADHD symptom improvement with supplementation um, has, uh, ADHD symptoms have been shown to improve with supplementation of zinc and magnesium. Um, and I am one of those people who thinks if we can get something naturally from a food source, I would rather recommend that to a family to kind of help start developing other good food habits and positive lifestyle habits in a child, rather than again saying, this is a pill, this will fix this, you know, because it's only a temporary solution with a supplement as it is. And it's a lot harder to regulate supplementation in kids because there aren't as many good recommendations about what the safe limits are for those. So good food sources of zinc and magnesium um, are red meat, lamb, pork, shellfish, lentils, beans, chickpeas, pine nuts, peanuts, cashews, almonds, and potatoes. And you can see a lot of items on that list can be very kid friendly, especially some of the nuts. Um, and they have those fun like roasted chickpea snacks now that you'll find in the stores or like um, things of that nature. And as a child, I would have eaten all the shellfish you, I could get my hands on, but <laughs> I know that that may not be a hot, hot topic for kids. Um, and then good food sources of magnesium are avocados, almonds, cashews, lentils, beans, chickpeas, peas, bananas, and leafy greens. Um, so again, going back to this idea that if they can get it naturally through their diet, a lot of these things are part of what can be a very healthy diet for children, and it's just a matter of helping them integrate those things into everyday nutrition. Um, another thing I like to highlight are food additives. Now, we probably know that there's that um, um, fine gold diet that had been tested and retested and it pops up every once in a while for treatment of ADHD. And a lot of times, um, what we find is that you have these peaks and valleys of popularity with the fine gold diet um, as it relates to ADHD because we have different ways of kind of testing that intervention. And ultimately what ends up happening is that there's never a statistically significant effect of the Feingold diet 
over repeated cohorts of kids. And my belief is that what's really happening here is that there are some kids who really are sensitive to food additives, and there are some kids who are not sensitive to food additives. Um, but the European Union has led the charge in recommending elimination of all azo dyes, so food dyes that um, seem to be clinically linked to negative effects in children's behavior. And I know that we've had some grocery stores locally, especially like Aldi has taken all of the food dyes and preservatives out of their products. And in my mind, I think there is no clinically necessary need for a child to have food dyes or food additives or preservatives. So is there any harm in eliminating those things? Absolutely not. So let's look at how we can take some of those things out of our children's diet it, and perhaps, again, get them back eating natural foods that have some of the vitamins, minerals, fiber, um, and natural things in them that are only going to benefit them over the course of their lifetime, including their uh, um, obesity rates and heart disease and cognitive function as they get older. Um, and then in a 2015 study, they did find that artificial food colorants have a small but statistically significant adverse effect on ADHD symptoms in some children. And that's why I liked that they said that, in some children. Um, just like every child is not going to respond the same way to Adderall, every child may not respond the same way to eliminating food additives. But the risk of eliminating food additives is zero. <laughs> so it's worth a shot, especially for who for families who are willing to try. Um, inflammation is another big um, dietary link with ADHD. There's an association between increased risk for ADHD and an inflammatory response. And this is where I introduced the idea of omega-3 supplementation, um, either through supplements or through food sources. It is a heck of a lot harder to get kids to eat sardines and mackerel <laughs> than it is for them to eat avocados and bananas. <laughs> so. <laughs> you may have to look at omega-3 supplementation, and they do have liquids and gummies. Just watch the artificial flavors and colorings and gummies for the omega-3s. Um, but certainly, there's no risk associated with having plenty of food sources of omega-3s in your diet unless you're considering um, mercury content, which you do want to be mindful of. Um, and then lastly is it applies to dietary intervention, sugar intake. So, you know, here in the United States, we have lobbyists and we have big time sugar lobbyists. And that is why you will never see, well, at least not in the next decade, probably, a um, daily recommended allowance of sugar on anything because every food is probably going to max that out in one serving. The World Health Organization recommends calories from sugar be less than 10% of your diet um, and uh, 50 grams or I think what's missing under the screen there is it five teaspoons? I can't see it behind the the people's <laughs> five to 10 teaspoons or 50 grams. And if you think about the size of a teaspoon, an actual measuring teaspoon, and you think about five to 10 of those a day, you know, that's a very small amount compared to what we're actually ingesting in everything from our bread to our pasta sauce. I'm always alarmed at how much sugar's in pasta sauce. Like my grandma was always like, you just do just a pinch just a pinch. <laughs> um, and then the link between sugar-sweetened beverages and ADHD symptoms has been demonstrated in studies, and then disruption of the gut microbiota based on the prolifer proliferation of um, the type of bacteria that we don't want that are feeding on sugar in your gut um, versus the type that you do want happily, healthily living in your gut. Um, so I wanted to present um, a case study. We're going to look at Bobby. Um, and Bobby is a 10-year-old male, and he's based on a real-life patient that I've seen um, and kind of the accumulation of things from a couple other patients. So he's a 10-year-old male, and he resides with his biological parents. Teachers report that Bobby's moody, disorganized, inattentive, forgetful, and high energy, and they're requesting an evaluation for ADHD. His parents indicate that because of his moods and his high energy, they're actually more worried that he could have bipolar disorder. 
Bobby's typical diet is a Pop-Tart for breakfast, peanut butter and jelly with Doritos and a Mountain Dew for lunch. Parents both work full time, so dinner is a convenience or frozen prepared meal, sometimes accompanied by a canned veggie, and that happens about three or four times a week. And then the other three or four times a week, they have fast food, often chicken nuggets, fries, and pop. Bobby spends about three hours after school doing his homework, and then the rest of the evening he plays video games. He typically goes to bed at 10, at 11.30 p.m., and it takes him an hour or longer to fall asleep, and then he wakes up begrudgingly for school at 6.30 a.m. On the weekends, he's up until midnight or later and sleeps until noon. So would you say that this is kind of the typical child that you might run into in practice? I run into these kids a lot. <laughs> So what are our concerns? Our concerns holistically are possibly inadequate nutrition. He could be lacking in magnesium, zinc, and iron, as well as fundamental vitamins, minerals, including omega-3 fatty acids. He's getting inadequate sleep. Like I said, the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends eight to 10 hours nightly. He's getting inadequate physical exercise. The American Academy of Pediatrics recommends 60, milligram, 60 minutes daily. He's getting too much screen time. The AAP recommends no more than two hours of screen time daily. He's having too much blue light exposure, especially within two hours of bedtime, which can prevent his natural melatonin production. He's eating too much sugar and refined carbohydrates, which is causing his blood sugars to rise and fall erratically throughout the day, which can be um, linked to his mood changes. He's having too much caffeine. Caffeine is a drug, and the AAP recommends zero, zero, no caffeine for kids under the age of 12, and no more than 100 milligrams for kids over the age of 12. This is very often forgotten, and I see kids in my office all the time with giant caffeinated sugary beverages. Um, we're seeing too many food dyes, preservatives, and additives in the prepared foods, and too much time spent on homework every evening. So our holistic treatment plan for Bobby, and this is something that we can all incorporate into our practice, is to recommend exercise at least 60 minutes per day, preferably outside in nature, reducing the homework time by breaking it up into chunks separated by exercise and time outdoors, sleeping eight to 10 hours a night, even on the weekends. We recommend a consistent schedule seven days a week. Um, eating a balanced diet, including fresh fruits, vegetables, protein, and whole grain carbohydrates, and reducing additives such as sugar, artificial colors, flavors, and preservatives. One of my favorite resources for this is called 100 Days of Real Food. You guys can all go check that out on your lunch break today. <laughs> and they could also consider a food elimination diet where they look at one thing that they can eliminate while making sure that they're still getting any of the essential vitamins, minerals, and nutrients that they need from that. Um, but eliminating, for example, cow's milk dairy, or gluten, or red dye, or blue dye, or a certain preservative, um, and seeing if there's a behavioral change over about the course of two weeks or so. Um, limiting screen time to two hours daily, eliminating blue light in the two hours before bedtime, eliminating sugar-sweetened beverages and replacing with something else like water, recommending executive skill development, which we talked about a little bit earlier, and working with the family and developing a realistic patient-centered plan to start meeting these goals. Ultimately, when I look at this, this is overwhelming to me, so it's absolutely gonna be overwhelming to a family, especially with a child who may be dealing with some ADHD-type symptoms. So you wanna start these things in small, reasonable steps and roll them out slowly over time so that they have a, a, a higher rate of success and they feel like they've really accomplished something. So that's pretty much it for me. Any